also, before we start the, the teaching, I'd like to continue with this theme of praying. Um, I'd like to remind us uh, or to remember that we're going to, we can pray for James, the, the, the young man that stood up here Sunday, and for his, um, his, his spiritual life, and as well as also, he mentioned, you know, the people that we, that um, probably in prison or uh, in the streets, that God would have mercy on them. So let's pray for James, and also for uh, Ms. Jane, her, that her daughter passed away. Let's keep her in prayer, so that God would give her the strength. And then also for Clay, that he shared with us that he, he's uh, his co-worker is, uh, was ill, and um, so he's praying that God would, would give, give Clay an opportunity to share the gospel with him and that he would be receptive to, to the gospel. Um, and then Sarah, that she requested prayers for, for her as she visits with her grandparents, that an opportunity would, would come so that she could uh, share the gospel with uh, her grandparents and that they would be receptive to, to the gospel. And also Stephen, I haven't seen Stephen for a while. You know, I think he's a CPA, an accountant, so I imagine the swamp would work, but let's keep him in prayer. And then Eric, there's Eric, the, the, uh, the, the son of uh, Julia, but there's another Eric that used to sit right here in the front on Sunday, younger man. And uh, I had a chance to talk to him one time, and he's, uh, he's searching uh, for God. He's, he's, he's going through some difficulties. So um, let's keep him in prayer as well. And, of course, you know, Pastor David and Miss Mary Lou, that God would, God would continue to work through them. And for this ministry, that God would uh, continue to strengthen uh, Clay as he teaches on Sunday. And also for myself, that uh, God would uh, continue to give me grace so that um, I can continue to study and share the, the word of God with you all. So let's, let's go before the Lord in prayer and, uh, and ask God for these, these petitions. Father, we come before your presence this evening to give you thanks because we can do so. Your, your word tells us that we can go before your holy throne and uh, that you are there to listen to us and to um, grant us our petitions if we ask according to your will. Lord, we pray for James, this young man who, God, you have saved from, from many, uh, many terrible things, Lord, many addictions. But, Lord, you don't, there's no one that is too far from your grace. Uh, and so we pray for him, and we pray for all those who are in prison, those who might be uh, in the streets. Lord, that your word will come to them and that they will be receptive to the, your word and that the light may shine in their lives. Pray for Ms. Jane as the, she, she suffers the loss of her daughter, God. I pray that... You give her strength so that she would, go, uh, she would stay strong under this difficult situation. Lord, we pray also for the co-worker of Mr., uh, our brother in Christ, Clay Jackson, that he would also, Clay would find the opportunity to share the gospel with him and that this man would be receptive to your word. Pray for Sarah and her grandparents that as Sarah shares the gospel with them, that they would open their hearts to you. Pray for Stephen, Lord, uh, who hasn't been here for a while. And Lord, we just pray that he's doing well and that he's doing well both physically and spiritually, that, Lord, that he's, he stays strong in you and in, in your word. Pray for Eric, this young man who, Lord, we, he has been here with us for a while, has been here with us a few Sundays, but we haven't seen him lately. Lord, I pray for him, for his spiritual need, needs, that you would give him light, that you would enlighten him, Lord, so that he can uh, uh, find the joy that comes from being in fellowship with you. Pray for him, we ask, Lord, and we thank you for Pastor David and for Miss Mary Lou, and we pray for them, God, that your grace would be upon them and that they would be healed completely. Pray for the doctors as well, that you would give them wisdom to diagnose the problem and to be able to give him the what he needs so that they can what they can get better, Lord. 
And we thank you, Father, for all your blessings. And we pray for your, for your grace upon this ministry, Grace Bible Church, that you will continue to supply all, all our needs, Lord, and that you will strengthen uh, Clay and myself as we, we continue to teach your word. Help us, Lord, to do it in, in the way that is honoring to you and that it brings edification to your flock. We ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. What a privilege to, to uh, come before the Lord in prayer and to, to put in practice what we've been taught, you know, to love one another, to love one another. I think that's one of the ways that we, we can do it, you know, by praying for one another and, and also sharing w what our needs are with the flock. Um, so that, that's really great. Today we'll continue with Romans chapter 7. Um, Romans chapter 7 is a chapter that, uh, it, that, that, that uh, has a defeat all over it, I think, uh, it, because the theme of Romans chap chapter 7 is the inadequacy of the law for, for spiritual victory. We cannot look to the law for spiritual victory because what the law will do is that it will point sin, and then uh, we'll, we'll see in chapter 7 that sin that resides in us takes the law and turns it against us, and by it, by the law, it kills us. It, it arouses sin in us. Uh, so we cannot look to the law for spiritual victory. But chapter 7 is preparing for chapter 8. Uh, we can look to the Spirit for spiritual victory. We can look to God, the Holy Spirit, who res uh, resides in the believer for spiritual victory. Our victory... Uh, uh, resides in our fellowship with Christ. We're not to look to the law for our sanctification. We're to uh, put our eyes on Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. That's what we're to do. We're to put our faith, our eyes on Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. Romans chapter 7, there's an outline here. Uh, Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. The believers, the believers have died to the Mosaic law. This is an outline by Dr. Uh, Douglas Moo. Verses 1 through 6. Believers have died to the law. Uh, and then verses 7 through 25. The experience of any person, believer or unbeliever, who attempts to serve God in the oldness of the letter or in the flesh, in his, not in his uh, sin nature, or, or with good desires. Verse 21 of chapter 7 puts out that even the desiring to do the, the will of God, it's not enough. It's not enough. It will not get us to victory in Christ Jesus. Good desires, even if they spring from who we are in Christ, will not uh, accomplish victory in us. What will accomplish victory? Fellowship with God. Fellowship through, uh, to, uh, to the Holy Spirit that resides in us. A love for God. I think a love for God is what will get us through, uh, to experience victory in our Christian uh, life. And then as sub, sub points under 725, we have uh, in seven. Verse, in verse 7 through 12, sin is the culprit that has used the law as a bridgehead to produce more sin and death. And that's why we don't look to the law for sanctification, because sin is the culprit that has used the law as a bridgehead to produce more sin and death in us. And then verses 13 through 25, the experience of a carnal person who, whose own weakness and internal divisions allow sin to gain the mastery despite the goodness of the law. Okay, So uh, what is the experience of those who choose to serve God by basing their, their or by looking to, towards the law for their strength? What is the experience of those who, who, um, look to the law for, for their strength 
to overcome the flesh. It's total defeat. Total defeat. Okay? So the believer is not under the law. Why? Because what the law does, it, uh, it, uh, it arouses sin in us. It is used by, the, by sin to defeat us, to defeat, to defeat us. And then we see the experience of those who choose to look to the law for their sanctification. And it's total defeat, total defeat. So where, is our, where does our victory rely? In chapter 8, in living in fellowship with God, the Holy Spirit in having a, a uh, love relationship with God, the Holy Spirit. And I think that's why it's very adequate that in chapter 7, he says that we are now married to Christ. We are married to Christ. We have a relationship of love with Christ. And that relationship of love with Christ is so that it can bring, um, uh, let's see, how does it say, bear fruit for God. Out of that relationship for Christ, there, the result of that relationship, like just on the, in the natural relationship, if there's a husband and a wife, the natural fruit of that relationship is ch children. So also, when we are married to Christ and we are married to Christ, we are now in Christ Jesus, the natural fruit of that relationship of love is for us to bear fruit for God, fruit for God. So we don't look to the law for our sanctification. We look to God, okay? So let's briefly go through these, read through these verses, um, verses 1 through 4, the analogy of, the, of marriage. Or do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives, for the married woman is bound by the law of her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Therefore, and this is the point of the of what he just has just said, of the illustration that he just said. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ. Through Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, we die to the law. To what purpose? So that you may be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead. And we know that to be Christ Jesus. Amen? So we are now joined to him who was raised from the dead, to what purpose? In order that we might bear fruit for God. So where does our sanctification, our victory over sin come from? Comes from? from our union with Christ, from our union with our new husband who is Christ. So the question for us would be, like, if you want to experience victory over sin, is ask yourself, how is my relationship with Christ? Uh, how is my fellowship with Christ? Am, am I spending time delighting myself in Christ and his word and in prayer? And, and, you know, all that, all that, in, that involves that relationship with Christ Jesus. Then verse 5. The reason why we're not under the law, for while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. So in the flesh is the old man who we were before we came to Christ. Uh, so when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions were aroused by the law. Uh, at work, which were aroused by the law, were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit to death. So the law came along to arouse sin. Uh, it aroused, the law says, don't covet, and there's a sin nature in me, 
which is the Adamic sin nature, which, which covets. That's its nature to covet. So when the law says don't covet, instead of uh, not coveting, what happened is that that commandment aroused the sin nature in me to covet. And so instead of um, fulfilling its intended purpose, it did the opposite. It produced uh, coveting in me. Verse 6, but now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. This is applicable to the believer. But now we have been released from the law. So we're no longer in flesh, but we have been released from the law. So I believe that he's speaking to believers. Having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the spirit and not in oldness of the letter. You know, if we, we could jump to verse 8, to chapter 8 right here. Uh, if we wanted to, because chapter 8 speaks about the spirit, how we're now in the, in the spirit. And, and he, he refers to that when he says we serve in newness of the spirit. So we, no, we are no longer in the, uh, the realm of the flesh, but we are now in the spirit. Okay, we have been released from the law and we're now in the spirit. Okay. So let's see. If, I think I have a diagram of that. We ha so the old domain would be in Adam, in sin, in death, under the law, and the flesh, in the flesh. The new domain under which we are now in is in Christ, under grace, life, righteousness, or justification, and newness of the spirit. So we are no longer uh, in flesh. We have been released from the law. All that belonged to the old domain. So that we serve in newness of the spirit. In the new domain in which we find ourselves. In Christ. In grace. In life. Righteousness. And the newness of the, of the spirit. So the believer, or the inner man, in verse 22, is a new creation with a corpse. I would call it the Adamic nature, or the sin nature, hanging around his neck that drags him to defeat. Verse 24. Uh, let's look at Romans 7, 24. But I'm hoping that from these verses, we're, we, get the, we, get to, we understand that the, as believers... We have been transferred from the old domain in flesh, under the law, sin, death, to the new domain, which is in Christ, grace, life, righteousness, and newness of the spirit. Okay? But even though we've been transferred to this new domain, we still have that Adamic nature that's like a corpse that is tied to us, that drags us to defeat. And that's a very vivid picture uh, of having a corpse. Uh, and that corpse is the old, the old man, the, the, who we were in Adam. It's still, even though it's dead, it's still, it's still there. It's still in us. And uh, that uh, corpse, that old man, is what pulls us to sin or to defeat. Verse 24 says, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Who will set me free from the body of this death? Wow, what a vivid picture. The believer, he's a new person in Christ, but he still has this body of death, uh, this corpse that uh, drags him to do things that, should, that he knows that he should not do. And so what does he need? Well, verse 25, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's what we need. We need the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can live a victorious life. 
in Christ Jesus so that we can produce fruit to God, so that we can be slaves of righteousness. We need to look to Christ Jesus, not only for our, sanctif not only for our justification, but also for our sanctification. We need to continue to put our eyes on Christ Jesus. Uh, an obsession with the law is the problem, I think, in chapter 7. When we look to the law for, for sanctification, I think that we get in, in, in trouble. But most people, that's not their problem, that they're obsessed with the law and, keep, and, and lose their eyes of Christ. I think that most, pro most of the time our problem is that we set our eyes on, on things of the earth instead of putting our eyes in Christ Jesus. Um, we set our, our eyes on things of this world, things that are passing, instead of putting our eyes on Christ Jesus. The Bible says that we are by nature's lovers of self more than of God. I think that's where the problem lies for many of us. Uh, we put our eyes in those things that bring, uh, gratify our flesh. We're focused on gratifying our flesh more than we are in honoring God. But, you know, to try to live the Christian life just by law observance will, will, not, will not result in a fruitful uh, or productive life in Christ Jesus. Okay? So, very good. Verses, verse 5. For while we were in the flesh, we, when we were in the old domain, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that which we were, um, we were bound so that we serve in newness of the spirit and not in oldness of the letter. I have a commentary by Douglas Moo. It says, it says, serving in the old state created by the letter meant not, as the Jews thought, a curbing of sin, but a stimulating of the power of sin, and death is the end product of sin. So the law was given to curb sin, but it had the opposite effect. It stimulated uh, sin. And the result was death. Now, through the believe, now though the believer released from the bondage to the law can serve in the new condition created by God's Spirit, a condition that brings life. Second Corinthians three six. Let's look to Second Corinthians chapter three, verse six. who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not to the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Interesting, right? The letter, mean, it's a reference to the law, to the Mosaic law. Uh, the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. That's our new relationship. It's to the Spirit and not to the law. Okay, um, a condition that brings life, 2 Corinthians 3, 6, and fruit pleasing to God in Romans chapter 6, verse 22 to 23. Looks, let's look at Romans chapter 6, 22 to 23. But now having been free from, the, from sin and enslaved to God, you serve, you, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, so that is the fruit that comes from pleasing God. Uh, being freed from sin. So when we are slaves of righteousness, we have become free from sin and enslaved to God. Okay, not, not total, I don't think the Bible teaches total perfection, 
but sin no longer has authority over the believer. And that, that authority, sin's authority has been removed in order, so, in order that we can bear fruit pleasing to God. Douglas Moo continues saying, before Paul goes on to develop the nature of, of serving in the spirit, which is Romans chapter 8, he pauses to explain further the condition of serving in oldness of the letter. So he pauses to explain further the condition of serving in the oldness of the letter and of being in the flesh where the law arouses sinful passions. The, ver the theme of verses 7 through 25. So Paul could have jumped to what it's like to live under the Spirit, Romans chapter 8. But instead, he, can, he develops what it's like to live under the law for the believer who, by some reason, chooses to look to the law for our sanctification. So this is what Romans 7, 27, 7 and on explains. Uh, what life looks like for those who choose to continue to live under the law. Okay? So we're told that we're no longer under the law, but for some reason, uh, the believer thinks that he can be sanctified by looking to the law, and Paul explains, no, you cannot be sanctified by looking to the law. Okay? Um, I think there's a, a clarification here, which I think is important. This one is also a clarification made by D Dr. Douglas Moo. He says, to be dead to the law, which we have studied, we are dead to the law, means to be delivered from the power sphere of the law. It does not necessarily mean that the believer has nothing more to do with the law. Thus, positively, as a witness... Thus, positively, as a witness, the law continues to teach the believer much that is indispensable about God's holiness and the holiness, and the holiness he expects from his people. So we can continue to learn from the law. So that's why we need God's word. We need the Old Testament. And praise God that our pastor is very keen on teaching from the Old Testament. So just because we're not under the law, it doesn't mean that we cannot, that we don't need the Old Testament or that we can't learn from the Old Testament. Of course we can. Uh, I, was, I just marveled that, you know, when we were studying um, the Old Testament I, where, you know, the people of Israel deliberately said, we don't want God to rule over us. That is mind-boggling. You know, how could a nation who has that high privilege of being chosen by God so that the Messiah could come to them, say, we don't want you to rule over us. Appoint a king like the rest of the nations to rule over us. And so that, that just de demonstrates the, the depravity of man. It just demonstrates how, by nature, we do not want God to rule over us. That is our nature. We do not want God to rule over us. So as we read the, the Old Testament, we, we see all these principles, uh, and we can learn from them. Moreover, while this verse implies that the believer is not directly under the authority of the law, this is not to say that individual commandments from the law may not be reapplied as new covenant law or as the law of Christ. Okay? So there are many things that are in the Old Testament that are repeated in the law of Christ. Okay? Actually, nine out of the Ten Commandments are repeated in the law of Christ. Okay? Because the, the moral law of God doesn't change. It was, it was sin to, 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 to murder before the law was given, the Mosaic law, and it was sin to murder when the Mosaic law was given, and it's sin to mur murder now under the law of Christ. Um, so, so there's a lot of things, a lot of commandments um, that were given in the, old, in the Old Covenant that are repeated in the New Covenant or are repeated in the law of Christ. Let's look at Romans chapter 8. 
verse 4. So that the requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So if we walk by the spirit, we will fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. We will fulfill the don't kill, don't steal, all these commandments. But in order to fulfill, in order to, uh, to fulfill these, these commandments, we have to learn to walk in the Spirit. We need to learn to let God govern our thoughts, our emotions. Uh, and we will, it says, those who walk by the Spirit will not fulfill, the, the, will not walk in the flesh or will put to death the, the flesh. But in order to put to death the flesh, we need to learn to walk in the Spirit. So though we are not under the law, we can fulfill the law by walking in the Spirit. That's, that's, that's wonderful. Um, chapter 13, chapter 13, verse 8. Owe nothing to anyone except love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So we're not under the Mosaic law, but we're under the, the, the law of Christ. But we can fulfill, the, fulfill the, the, the requirements of the Mosaic law when we learn to love one another. You know, John 13, verse 3 and 4, John 13, verse 34 and 35, Jesus says, A new commandment I give you, to love one another. Let's look at John so it's a new commandment to love one another, but it's really not a new commandment because it was, it was stated in the Old Testament. We were to lo- the summary of the law is to love God and to love one another. But it's a new commandment because we are now under the law of Christ. We are under the law of Christ and not under the Mosaic law. A new commandment I give you that you love one another even as I loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Okay? So we can learn from the law, and if we walk by the Spirit, we can fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. Douglas Moo continues to say, Finally, the law of which Paul speaks here is the Mosaic law. Paul affirms here that the believer is no longer under the authority of the Mosaic law, nor that he or she is under, nor that he or she is under no law at all. In fact, Paul himself makes clear that the believer is still under law in the broader sense, still obligated to certain commandments. Uh, see Galatians six two. Galatians six two. Let's look at. Uh, Galatians 6, 2. It says, bear one another's burdens, burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. The believer is under the law of Christ. But what happens if the believer focuses only on the law of Christ, on loving God and loving his neighbor and doing... The things that he'll later uh, tell us in chapter 12. And his focus is, ju- is just on a list of commandments. He will be, he will be defeated. He will be defeated. He, his focus needs to be on Christ. And as he, as he focuses on Christ and on his fellowship with Christ, on his relationship with Christ, then he will be able to fulfill the law of Christ. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7.19. 1 Corinthians 7.19. 
Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. But what matters is the keeping of the commandments of God. Okay? So I think this is ref referring to the commandments that we have as uh, age, uh, church, church age believers. The commandments of God that God has given to us, the church, his church. Uh, chapter 9 of First Corinthians, verse 20 and 21. So there, we have commandments, um, okay? But our focus needs to continue to be on, in Christ Jesus. To, to the Jew, I have become as a Jew so that I might win Jews. And to those who are under the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. And this reminds me of, of Timothy, how uh, when Paul in Acts chapter 16 meets Timothy, he says, he says you know, this, this man can, can be instrumental in the ministry. But since he was, he was a Gentile, he was Jew and Gentile, uh, he, he was uncircumcised. So what did Paul do? He had him circumcised. So that, that, so that his incircumcision would not be a hindrance to, to, the, to the, his ministry to the Jew. So he put, his, he put himself under the law if he had to, in order that he could reach the Jew. But he was not under the law. So as a believer, Paul did things that were, that were uh, prescribed in the law, like when he went to Jerusalem, he, he partook of a ceremony of cleansing. Uh, why? why? Why did he do that? He, that would be something that was still under the law. Well, he could continue to do those things if he chose, but he was still not under the law. It's like if, if a person is a, is a Jew and he chooses to abstain from eating certain foods, he can continue to abstain from eating certain foods. Though he has plain freedom to eat from them, if he violate, violates his conscience, it's better for him not to eat from those forbidden fruits. And that's a thing, theme of uh, Romans chapter 14. Some, some people have regards for days, you know, keep certain days. Well, that's fine. If they want to keep certain days, they want to keep the Sabbath and so forth, that's fine. Let them do it unto God. Let, let, let that be their service to God. They're free to do that. Uh, Paul was saying in Romans chapter 14, and, and those of you who don't uh, uh, have those requirements, those of you who don't observe the, the, those feasts and the Sabbaths that were part of the Mosaic law, don't judge your, your brother because you're not his master. You're not his master. Uh, he, he, he is serving God. And if that's, if that's what he wants to do, observe certain rituals and certain dates and, certain, and not eat certain foods, foods, that's fine. He can do that. Uh, don't judge him for that. But then he tells those who do observe all those things, he tells them, don't obligate your brother who doesn't do those things uh, because he's free not to do them. So we have that freedom in Christ Jesus. Uh, the, those who are Jews by, by nature, by upbringing, can continue to, to practice those ceremonies and so forth as part of their culture maybe or part of their service to God even though they're not under the law. Okay? So... Paul continues to say in 1 Corinthians 9, 21, So those who are without law as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I may win those without the law. This reminds me of Galatians chapter 2, where, uh, there was pr where Paul and Peter and Barnabas most likely were having a feast, were eating with the, with the Gentiles. And then when James comes around, and those of the circumcision comes around, then what does Paul do? He draws away 
he, he steps away from, from that fellowship. And Barnabas is, also does the same, like saying, we don't want nothing to do with the Gentiles. And Paul rebukes Paul severely. He says, you know, you're, you're not acting properly. You're, you're not um, consistent with your, your doctrine. And he, he rebukes him. And why does Paul rebuke him? I think that is because Paul, Paul Peter rather, by doing, what he's, by doing that, by withdrawing from the Gentiles, is, is saying you know, that God has not accepted the Gentiles. And that's a doctrinal issue. And so Paul couldn't let it slide. Uh, he had to confront him. He had to confront him. So Paul was okay with eating with, those, with the Gentiles. He was okay with that. So that's why he says, with, with those that are without the law, I'm like them, without the law, even though... I am under the law of Christ. Uh, he, al he was always under the law of Christ. 22, he says, To the weak I have become weak, that I may win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I may by all means save some. His goal was to bring as many people to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So believers can still, uh, if they chose to uh, practice certain things that are, un that, are, are, that are under the law uh, or that are prescribed by the law, even though they are no longer under the law. Okay, so we're not under the law. We are under the law of Christ. We are under the law of Christ. Okay, uh, 7, 5 of Romans, I think we've already looked at that. Uh, of Romans 7, 5. Basically, it says, uh, in asserting that, that sinful passions are through the law, in this verse 7, 5, Paul reaffirms the close connection between sin and the law that he has touched on before. However, here, however, he appears to go further and speak of the law as not just revealing sin or as turning sin into transgression, but as actually producing sin itself. And, and once again, that is why we are no longer under the law. And that is why we as believers do not look to the law for our sanctification. Okay, so let's go back to Romans. Romans 7. Okay, we got to get past these first verses. Okay, verse 7. Let's jump to verse 7. Okay. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Because we have seen how, how sin uses the law and, and, it, and it brings death to the believer. So then Paul says, what, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? And then he answers, may it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to no sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Um, okay, so it says here, I would not have come to no sin. And... And the question is, but what kind of knowing is this? This is a question that Douglas Moo asked, and, it's, and he answers. So what kind of knowing is this? Okay, When he says, I would not have come to no sin. Uh, what kind of knowing is this? Perhaps the most obvious possibility is that Paul is talking about the law as defining sin. Okay, that's... So when the law comes, uh, it defines sin. So he said, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. So the law comes and it defines sin. So that might be what he has in mind, the defining of sin. Through the law, the revelation of the righteous standard of God, I came to know that certain acts are sinful. That, for example, my inner desire to possess is nothing but a coveting that is prohibited by God. This is no, this is no doubt true. 
But Paul implies, implied earlier that such knowledge is available even to those who do not have the Mosaic law. They also know that what is right and wrong. So the law does more than just define sin. The, t the context in which Paul stresses that the law reveals sin to be sin is render sin and render sin um, utterly sinful suggests a stronger nuance that through the law I came to understand or recognize the real nature and power of sin. So I think this is what Paul has in mind when he says that through the law he came to know sin. When the law came, I came to understand or recognize the real nature of sin. The law, by branding sin as transgression and by bringing wrath and death, unmasks sin in its true colors. But we should probably go further and conceive this understanding of sin, not in a purely noetic way, but in terms of actual experience. Through the law, I have come to experience sin for what it really is. Through the law, sin works in me all kinds of sinful desires. And through the law, sin comes to life and brought death. It is through this actual experience of sin then that I come to understand the real sinfulness of sin. So it's more than just that, that the, the law defines sin. But when the law comes, you actually see how sinful sin is. Because sin does more than just defines what, what is right and wrong. But sin is taken by, takes, I mean, the, the law does more than just define what is right and wrong. Um, We see the, the character of sin, we see the real, the true color of sin when it takes what is right and uses it against us to produce sin, which will result in death. So that's when, so, so that's the, 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 uh, the knowledge that the law brings. It, it shows us how sinful sin is. It shows us how sinful sin is. Imagine taking something that is good and, and then causing it to produce something bad in the person. This was good. It was intended to be good. But sin comes, around, comes along and uses it against us. So there we see how sinful sin is. Okay. Okay, verse 8, but sin taking opportunity through the commandment produced in me coveting of all, of every kind, for apart from the law, sin is death, is dead. Sin is dead. Uh, taking opportunity. The, this word perfectly conveys the role that Paul assigns to the law in this verse. It refers often to the base of operation or bridgehead required for successful military operation. So sin takes opportunity through the commandment. It uses the commandment as a bridgehead, as a brace, as a base of operation to launch its darts at the believer. Uh, so the law says don't covet, and sin takes, takes that law as a dart to incite covetousness in the believer. The law says don't commit adultery. And uh, sin takes that commandment. And uses it as a dart. To, to uh, incite unfaithfulness in the believer. So we see how powerful sin is. And how evil sin is. And we also see how, how our evil our sin. Our sin nature is. Uh, we see how it's, recept it, it, it's receptive to sin. It likes sin. Uh, so that sin combined with our sin nature will only produce death in the believer. Verse 9, 
I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive, and I died. And I died. This verse is very interesting, and um, I think we need to look at it because we need to ask ourselves, who is the I? Is this Paul as an unbeliever coming of age? Uh, that's one view. I was once alive apart from the law. I was a young man. I was a child, and I did not know the, the law of God. Uh, but when the commandment came, sin became alive, and I died. And then, So when I became a young man, and, and lust became an issue in my, my sin nature, uh, then, then I died. The commandment came... Uh, Sin became alive and I died. Okay, so some take it to mean um, Paul, the unbeliever, uh, coming of age. And we'll, we'll look at that, I think, next week because uh, it's, it's very elaborate. Some will say that this, is, this I is Paul in solidarity with Adam. Adam was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and he died. The problem with that view is that the Mosaic law was not given to Adam. But a law was given to him. And when that law came, uh, sin became alive and he died. The I can also be Paul in solidarity with Israel. When, when Israel received the law, the Mosaic law, uh, sin became alive and I died. And, you know, because we study the Old Testament a lot here in this church, we can say that we can answer this question. What effect did the law have on the people of Israel, on the nation of Israel? What effect did the law have on the nation of Israel? Was it an obedient nation? It was not an obedient nation. It did not have the, the, the desire that it, that the, the outcome that it was intended for. We do not see an obedient nation. Even when Christ comes and does all these miracles, uh, did they obey? They did not obey. It did not have the, 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 uh, the result. It did not give the result that it was intended for. So the, the commandment came and I died. So Paul in solidarity with the nation of Israel. And then there's another view that says this this I is Paul as a carnal Christian trying to live for God under his own strength. And what we need to do is get him out of chapter 7 and put him in chapter 8. Uh, this is the carnal Christian. And that's kind of my view. But then you have also um, Paul, the Christian, Paul's Christian experience at any moment. And that's the view of uh, of um, uh, Zane Hodges. This is Paul's Christian experience at any moment. You can be a, 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 a mature Christian, and as soon as you, the commandment comes and you choose to give in to that, you will experience death. So, so in his view, you, you are never, you can never say, I'm now in chapter 8. Sin is no longer an issue with me. No, you could be in chapter 8, but it doesn't take much to, for you to fall in chapter 7, where you're totally defeated by sin. And I think I like that view uh, a little more. Uh, the realization that maturity is never a plateau. We're always doing this in our Christian walk. We, we can render to the Spirit and grow and, and, and obey God, or we can, we can be uh, taken by the sin nature and, and experience total defeat. And that happens from one minute to the other. One minute to the other. Um, so I think that's the view that Zane Hodges holds, that that's the I in chapter, in verse 9. In verse nine. But what are we getting after? Because we're, we're out of time. We're getting after that the believer cannot look to the law for victory over sin or for a life that is pleasing to God. 
Uh, he cannot because, because why? Uh, sin takes the law and turns it against us to produce sin and death. And why should we not look to the law for our sanctification? Because of the experience that those that do look to the law have. And that's what, is, what we'll see in the rest of this uh, uh, chapter. A, a experience of total defeat. A total defeat. Okay. Well, we'll go ahead and finish here. And uh, we'll uh, for sure finish next week. We should have finished today, but we'll, we'll finish next, this chapter next week, Lord willing. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your kindness towards us. Thank you for your word that tells us what, what is your perfect will, that instructs us, that feeds us. But we thank you, God, for the Holy Spirit that lives in us, God, the Holy Spirit that lives in us, who enlightens us, who opens the scriptures to us, who uh, allows us to feed our, our spirit so that we can walk in newness of the spirit. Thank you, God, that we have this dynamic life of God living in us, God, the Holy Spirit living in us, so we can live the Christian life. Lord, help us never to forget that it's not just law. It's not just knowing the word of God, but it's, but it's a, a, a relationship with, with God, the Holy Spirit, that will enable us to live for you. Thank you, God, for, for this revelation, for this knowledge that it's in your word. And thank you for your Holy Spirit. Uh, we pray that you would now take us home safely and that you would bring us back when, when, uh, next week so that we can continue to study your word. We thank you, Father, in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen.